I'm not very good at zippers. <laughs> but maybe if I had some help. I'll help you. I am an expert. There is a flama, there is a luna. Tu tiene mar pario. Hey friend, welcome to my channel Karina Lude where we break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so and turn your notifications on so you never miss an upload. Today is my last and final updated video on Rita Hayworth, don't worry. Rita Hayworth is one of the most iconic figures in Hollywood and her beauty and charm have made her a timeless star. She is truly one of my favorite iconic starlets from the glamorous era of Hollywood, but she had the saddest, most bitter story of Hollywood of all, in my opinion. Hayworth's childhood trauma almost certainly explains her adult sadness and insecurity. She appeared in over 60 movies throughout her career, ranging from classic film noir to romantic comedy to French new wave cinema. Her most famous roles include the femme fatale in Gilda opposite Glenn Ford, the sensuous Eva Peron, and the lady from Shanghai, and the legendary Sadie Thompson opposite Jose Ferrer and Miss Sadie Thompson. She was also part of a number of musicals, including You'll Never Get Rich with Fred Astaire and Cover Girl with Gene Kelly. One of the most photographed starlets in history, by 1940, there was 3,800 stories and over 12,000 pictures of Rita Hayworth in circulation. I'm telling you, there's a lot of pictures out there of Rita Hayworth, take it from me. Hayworth's incredible fame and popularity was due to more than just her acting. She had an allure that was unmatched by any other star of her time. I've never really thought of myself as a sex goddess, Hayworth once said, more as a comedian who could dance. End quote. With the flip of her hair or the blink of an eye, Hayworth had a witty way of reminding you that she was more than a pretty face on a poster, a symbol of someone else's desire. Dubbed the love goddess by the media, she graced magazine covers across the world and became an enduring image for American World War II servicemen as the most popular wartime pinup girl ever. Her beauty was so striking that Life magazine once declared that she was probably born with the heart of gold, but it was certainly gilded later on. Along with Veronica Lake, Julie London, and Lauren Bacall, she was one of four inspirations that helped create the character of Jessica Rabbit. Hayworth's legacy is still felt today, as she is listed as one of the top 25 female motion picture stars in AFI's 100 Years, 100 Stars survey. Her influence can be seen far beyond her starring roles. Modern day celebrities like Beyonce have been inspired by Hayworth's look and glamour, citing her performances as major influences on their own artistic expressions. Rita Hayworth's appeal remains timeless. Audiences can still feel both captivated and spellbound by her performances, while being moved by the complexity of her character's emotions. Those who appreciate film history will never forget this Hollywood legend. Rita Hayworth will always be remembered for bringing light into every dark corner through her enigmatic presence on screen. Before we get into her childhood and all the sadness of it all, let's first dissect her beauty because she was called the goddess of love because of her beauty, so let's dissect that. In 1949, Hayworth's lips were voted best in the world by the Artist League of America. She had a modeling contract with Max Factor to promote its true color lipsticks and pan stick makeup. With a side part, Rita's long thick hair fell in gentle waves over her shoulders. It wasn't as strict and unchanging as the other styles of that time, you know how they had the basic similar stiff hairstyle. No, hers was more carefree and bouncy, playing up the dancer's natural grace and sexiness. Rita was known to apply olive oil over her mid limbs of her hair and then wash it off with a mild shampoo 15 minutes later. This was her trick to nourish and maintain her lush locks. Even before gel and acrylic, her nails looked like deadly talons. In fact, rumor had it that her nails were Hollywood's longest. She often painted them to complement her lip color, as was the norm in the 40s. Rita applied a small amount of natural colored blush just below her cheekbones to highlight the shape of her face. Rita Hayworth admitted in an interview that she put in a full eight hours per day on the dance floor. She never indulged in carbohydrates and stayed away from baked goods. She also did the bagged stack stretch and swing system outside of her dance practice. No special equipment was needed for this program, which instead relied on dance-like aerobic steps. 
Her favorite color was Chart Rouge. Her favorite food was Mexican food. Rita liked to collect perfumes. One of Rita's favorite hobbies was learning to bullfight and even took lessons throughout the 1960s. It seems she also practiced at home with husband Orson Welles, who played the part of the bull. <laughs> now let's get into her childhood. Rita Hayworth's childhood was filled with the influence of two passionate and creative parents. Her father, Eduardo Cancino, was a dancer of Romani descent from a small town near Seville. Spain. Her mother, Volga Hayworth, was an American of Irish and English descent who had performed with the fame like Ville Foley's. Both parents had a strong desire for their daughter to follow in their footsteps. Eduardo wanted Margarita, Rita's birth name, to become a professional dancer while her mother hoped she would become an actress. What many don't know is that Rita Hayworth's roots ran much deeper than her recent family members. Her paternal grandfather, Antonio Cancino, was renowned as one of the greatest classical Spanish dancers of all time. He popularized the traditional bolero dance and had a world famous dancing school in Madrid. His legacy has been passed down through the generations and no doubt made an impact on Rita's career path. In addition to being exposed to dance at an early age, Rita also began studying acting when she was just seven years old. She studied under Maria Uspenskaya, who taught her how to project emotions onto the big screen, a skill that would prove invaluable in her later career as an actress and singer. Rita also took up singing lessons when she was 12 years old and quickly became quite talented in the area as well. By this time, it was clear that both Eduardo and Volgo's dreams for their daughter were coming true. Rita Hayworth was already beginning to make a name for herself as a triple threat performer. Despite being underage and not legally allowed to perform in nightclubs, Edward, her father, continued to book gigs for his daughter, even passing her off as his wife on occasions in order to get around child labor laws. Rita was just a young girl at the time and she had no choice but to go along with her father's wishes, performing every night alongside him without rest or reprieve. Hayworth later recalls saying, from the time I was three and a half, as soon as I could stand on my own feet, I was given dance lessons. She noted, I didn't like it very much, but I didn't have the courage to tell my father. So I began taking the lessons, rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. That was my girlhood. End quote. In 1931, Eduardo Cancino partnered with his 12-year-old daughter to form an act called The Dancing Cancinos. Her hair was dyed from brown to black to give her a more mature and Latin appearance. Since under California law, Margarita was too young to work in nightclubs and bars, her father took her with him to work across the border in Tijuana, Mexico. In the early 1930s, it was a popular tourist spot for people from Los Angeles. Because she was working, Rita never graduated from high school, but she completed the ninth grade at Hamilton in high school in Los Angeles and that really made her sad too. Edward, her father, treated his daughter like an adult and would often bark orders at her during their performances. He even once publicly berated Rita for having forgotten the steps during a routine at a club, embarrassing her in front of an audience filled with patrons who were there to enjoy the show. Unfortunately, this kind of treatment wasn't uncommon for Rita. While she was growing up on many occasions, Edward would take advantage of his daughter's fame and beauty by calling upon on her to dance for wealthy clients in exchange for money or gifts. This was something that Rita never wanted. However, she felt powerless against her father's wishes and had no choice but to comply. Hayworth confided to Orson Welles that her father began to sensually take advantage of her as a child. When they were touring together as the dancing casinos, her biographer Barbara Leeming wrote that her mother may have been the only person to know. She slept in the same bed as her daughter to try to protect her from incest. Leeming wrote that the abuse experienced by Hayworth as a young girl continued to her difficulty in relationships as an adult. And also her mother died really young from alcoholism. She also was not happy. So I wonder what the dad was even doing to her to make her that unhappy. In spite of all of this though, Rita managed to look back on these experiences fondly when reflecting on her childhood years later in life. She told one reporter that despite everything that happened between them, she still loved her father deeply, saying, my dad gave me my start in show business, said Hayward, and I owe him everything. Her words demonstrated both the mutual love and admiration she shared with Edward until his death in 1969 proving that every little girl just wants to see her daddy in a positive light, even if he caused her so 
much harm. Now let's get into the other controversy, which was all the plastic surgeries. In the 1940s, Rita Hayworth had a goal to become a major Hollywood star. However, her Mediterranean looks and last name were seen as too foreign for the classic American archetype desired by the studios. As a result, she was often limited to fewer exotic roles. It was then that producer Harry Cohn and press agent Charles Judson stepped in, encouraging her to change her name from Rita Cancino to Rita Hayworth so she could emphasize her Irish American ancestry. But that wasn't all the transformation they enforced. In order to make Hayworth look more like a standard Hollywood starlet, they put her through various plastic surgery procedures. She underwent electrolysis to raise her hairline and broaden the appearance of her forehead, while also dyeing her hair dark red. The end results made Hayworth look more European than she ever had before, and it worked. Her new look helped propel her career into stardom with some of the most memorable performances of classic cinema, such as Gilda and CoverGirl. Hayworth's story is an enduring reminder of how much pressure stars face when it comes to fitting into certain molds set by Hollywood. It's a testament to how far some are willing to go in order to pursue their dreams of becoming big screen stars, even if it means undergoing drastic changes in order to do so. The studios also put Rita through hours of makeup, hairstyling, and exercise regimens in order to create their desired image for the starlet. She had to wear wigs, high heels, and heavy makeup whenever she was on set or attending photo shoots. It must have been exhausting. She was told over and over again that who she was authentically was not good enough. The studios were not satisfied until Rita would look in the mirror and see someone completely different than who she was born to look like. Her father also did not like that they changed her last name to Hayworth and it created some strain between her and her family. It was like she was erasing her Spanish ancestry. But I guess all the transformation did pay off. Hayworth had top billing in one of her best known films, the Technicolor musical Cover Girl, released in 1944. The film established her as Columbia's top star of the 1940s and it gave her the distinction of being the first of only six women to dance on screen with both Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire, saying, I guess the only jewels of my life, Hayworth said in 1970, were the pictures I made with Fred Astaire and CoverGirl too. Three consecutive years, starting in 1944, Hayworth was named one of the top movie box office attractions in the world. She was adept in ballet, tap, ballroom, and Spanish routines. Cohn continued to showcase Hay Hayworth's dance talents, Columbia featured her in the Technicolor film Tonight and Every Night with Lee Bowman and Down to Earth with Larry Parks. She also played in Gilda, and in 1941, Hayworth said she was the antithesis of the characters she played. She said, I am naturally very shy and I suffer from an inferiority complex. Her provocative role in Gilda in particular was responsible for people expecting her to be what she was not. Hayworth once said, with some bitterness, men go to bed with Gilda, but wake up with me. Basically, I'm a good, gentle person, but I'm attracted to mean personalities." End quote. During filming of Gilda, she and her co-star Ford had an on-again, off-again relationship. Unexpectedly, their turbulent romance lasted for quite some time in real life. 40 years. <laughs> they had a relationship for 40 years. Ford even moved in next doors to Hayworth in Beverly Hills at one point. The fourth atomic bomb in history was exploded above the Pacific Ocean Atoll of Bikini in 1946. What's funny is that bomb featured a likeness of Hayworth in the name Gilda, stenciled on it in tribute to her bombshell status. Hayworth took it as a personal insult when she learned that an atomic bomb would be renamed after her Gilda character. Orson Welles, Hayworth's then husband, said that she nearly went insane from rage. People didn't always receive Rita warmly during those days. They saw her more like a harlot on screen. An article in the British periodical, The People, called for a boycott of Hayworth's film, saying, Hollywood must be told its already tarnished reputation will sink to rock bottom if it restores this reckless woman to a place among its stars. End quote. Mm. Hayworth had a strained relationship with Columbia Pictures for many years. In 1943, she was suspended without any pay for nine weeks because she refused to appear in Once Upon a Time. During this period in Hollywood, contract players could not choose their films. They were on salary rather than receiving a fixed amount for pictures. So they told him what movies to be in. And she also had a problem with her always being like the bad femme fatale in movies. She wanted to play more softer roles, but again, they didn't have a choice. She didn't have a choice which movies she picked. They just told her what to do. And if she didn't do it, they would cut off her money and cut off her salary. 
which sucked, but it was worse back then. There's a little bit more freedom here now. In 1947, Hayward's new contract with Columbia provided a salary of $250,000 plus 50% of film's profit. In 1951, Columbia alleged it had 800,000 invested in properties for her, including the film she walked out on that year. Hayworth left Hollywood to marry Prince Ali Khan and was suspended for failing to report to work on the film Affair in Trinidad. To get out of her contract with Columbia Pictures, she filed a lawsuit in 1955 demanding $150,000 in damages for the filming delay of Joseph and His Brethren, which was eventually filmed by a foreign company in 1961. Cohn expressed his frustration in a 1957 interview with Time Magazine saying, Hayworth might be worth $10 million today easily. She owned 25% of the profits with her own company and had hit after hit and she had to get married and had to get out of the business and took a suspension because she fell in love again in five years at two pictures a year at 25 percent think of what she could have made but she didn't make pictures she took two or three suspensions she got mixed up with different characters unpredictable end quote years after her film career had ended and long after Cohn had died Hayward still resented her treatment by both him and Columbia she spoke bluntly in a 1968 interview saying I used to have to punch a time clock at Columbia every day of my life. That's what it was like. I was under exclusive contract, like they owned me. I think he had my dressing room bugged. He was very possessive of me as a person. He didn't want me to go out with anybody, have any friends. No one can live that way, so I fought him. You want to know what I think of Harry Cohn? He was a monster, end quote. Later on, in 1972, she said, Harry Kahn thought of me as one of the people he could exploit and make a lot of money. And I did make a lot of money for him but not much for me. Now let's get into her marriages, which is another sad ordeal. Rita Hayworth's first marriage was a story more dramatic than any of her films. The 18-year-old starlet married Edward C. Judson, an oilman turned promoter, in Las Vegas in 1937. Judson had played a major role in launching her acting career and, more, and was more than twice her age. He quickly became not only her husband, but also her manager. Hayworth later admitted that while he did help her with her career, he helped himself to my money. This pattern of domineering behavior would eventually lead to their divorce. In 1942, having endured four years of what she considered physical and emotional abuse from Judson, Rita filed for divorce on the grounds of cruelty. It was revealed during their divorce proceeding that Judson had failed to tell Hayworth that he had previously been married twice before they got married, a fact which further enraged Rita's father, who had never approved of the union from the start, causing a rift between Hayworth and her parents until after the divorce proceedings were complete. Now, as far as her relationship with Orson Welles, Rita Hayworth and Orson Welles were Hollywood's iconic couple who had a whirlwind romance that ended in an epic marital disaster. The two actors first met in 1941 while filming the movie The Lady from Shanghai. They began dating shortly after and got married on September 7th, 1943, even though none of her colleagues knew about their wedding until the day before. In 1944, Hayworth gave birth to their daughter Rebecca, who tragically passed away in 2003 at only the age of 59. Despite having such a beautiful child together, it wasn't enough for them to stay together as husband and wife. Hayworth was not the love goddess that Wells had seen her to be in films. Instead, she was a fragile, abused woman who would never be the same. Orson Welles made it his mission to improve her appearance, professional standing, and academic background. It's another example of a man thinking she wasn't good enough. Wells believed his goal of molding Hayworth into a woman who was both beautiful and intelligent was done out of love. He had pure intentions, according to him. But the pattern of controlling Hayworth was all too familiar. Their union was doomed as Wells' idealized version of Hayworth. He was trying to change her, make her into this woman that she just was not. It just seemed like no one wanted to accept her for who she was. In fact, Hayworth revealed that Wells never wanted to even settle down in one place from the very beginning of their marriage. During the entire period of our marriage, he showed no interest in establishing a home, she said. When I suggested purchasing a home, he told me he didn't want that responsibility. She went on further to explain that Wells felt their marriage was restricting his freedom. Mr. Wells told me he never should have married in the first place, that it interfered with his freedom and his way of life, end quote. Despite being one of Hollywood's most famous couples, Rita Hayworth and Orson Welles' marriage sadly ended only after five years together due to irreconcilable differences. 
Now her next marriage was no better. Rita Hayworth's third marriage to the international playboy Prince Ali Khan was as scandalous as it was glamorous. The pair first met at a nightclub in 1948 and their chemistry was instantaneous, but she was cautious due to previous heartbreaks. He wooed and chased her, as they always do, flaunting his wealth in her face. Khan's home on the Riviera was an oceanfront mansion complete with a swimming pool, butler service, and breathtaking vistas, so that Khan could take his private jet just about anywhere at any time. He also had a bedroom safe stocked with thousands of dollars in practically every currency. Even after more convincing, Hayworth finally admitted that she was in love with him. It must have been all the money, right? <laughs> it seems that Khan had a gypsy fortune teller visit his mansion to reassure Hayworth that he was the one. So the fortune teller was like, you should marry him. Mm. That's why I don't believe in those things because now I look, right? Khan proposed to Hayworth after he had already wooed, courted, and slept with her. However, she turned down his initial proposal. Hayworth moved into a house across the street from Khan's Los Angeles mansion after she returned to the United States. Khan's passionate courtship of her persisted and he showered her with gifts, the cutest of which was a tiny puppy. As a result of their whirlwind romance, the two were married only nine months later on May 27, 1949. Hayworth had frequently referred to Orson Welles as my greatest love. Hayworth begged Welles to come see her before her wedding to Prince Ali Khan in 1949. When Welles checked into her hotel, she, he saw something shocking. He entered Hayworth's room to find candles burning and she was wearing this little revealing nightdress. She begged him to marry her again and Welles had to console her by explaining why their marriage would never last. It seems that the tragedy of Hayworth's life never left Wells' mind for as long as he lived and I think he kind of regretted turning her down that second time. At the time of their nuptials, both Hayworth and Khan were deeply entrenched with the entertainment world. Hayworth had achieved Hollywood stardom with her role in Gilda, while Khan had become notorious for his high profile romances with many of Hollywood's biggest stars. Despite their fame and glowing reputation, however, all was not smooth sailing between Hayworth and Khan. During their two year marriage, Khan committed numerous indiscretions, including being spotted dancing with actress John Fontaine at a nightclub, who was Hayworth's rival. Imagine that. When Hayworth found out about this betrayal, she filed for divorce from him on September 2nd, 1951 on grounds of extreme mental cruelty. The divorce proceedings between Khan and Hayworth were tumultuous to say the least. During one hearing, their three-year-old daughter, Princess Jasmine, Princess Yasmin Aga Khan, clamored onto the judge lap when it sat on the judge laps. Matters became further complicated when the prince said he wanted Yasmin to be raised as a Muslim, whereas Hayworth wanted her to be raised as a Christian, an issue which sparked a lengthy custody battle between them both. In the end, despite offering his ex-wife $1 million if she would rear Yasmin as a Muslim from age seven and allow her to visit. Ultimately, however, Rita went back to acting after winning the custody battle, where she eventually starred in such classics as Pal Joey, while Ali Khan went back to his international playboy lifestyle until his death in 1960 at age 48 in an automobile accident near Paris, France. Second to last marriage, Dick Himes probably the worst of them all. When Rita Hayworth and Dick Himes first met, he was still married and his singing career was wanting. In spite of this, their connection was immediate and powerful. He was a dusty of all dusties, okay? Himes had recently come to the United States from Argentina, but did not have solid proof of American citizenship. Hoping Hayworth could influence the government, Himes asked her to assume responsibility for his citizenship. So in this sense, marry me for papers. She agreed to do it. The couple quickly became popular in Hollywood social circles with a lavish lifestyle that included parties at some of the most exclusive nightclubs in Los Angeles. Whenever they made an appearance at these clubs, crowds would flock to hear Hames perform. Soon enough, even bigger audiences started showing up just for him. Things began to go south for the couple when it became apparent that the two of his former wives were taking legal action against him for unpaid child support. His financial problems were so severe that he was unable to return back to California from New York. It was then that Hayward stepped in and ended up paying most of his debts. He also alienated her from her own children. Her children were left in the care of a, of a sitter while she and her fourth husband, Dick, vacation in Florida in 1954. This isn't even the worst part though. Neighbors reportedly saw Hayward's kids going through the trash, yes, and realized the babysitter was over her head and overwhelmed. This concerned citizen reported the incident to the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. The sitter 
though is problematic because come on <laughs> in 1954 their relationship took another turn when the couple got into a heated argument at la's coconut grove nightclub and publicly displayed physical violence when he slapped her in front of a crowd this incident shook her deeply and her doctor ordered her to remain bedridden for days afterwards as a result of this altercation and other underlying tensions between them they soon separated and never saw each other again after the night at coconut grove the tumultuous end of their marriage serves as yet another reminder of how quickly things can change when Hollywood romances is involved. She was also briefly married to James Hill, and he was another weirdo who really spoke very badly about her in front of company, but she escaped that also. Now, as far as her Alzheimer's, Orson Welles noted Hayward's problem with alcohol during their marriage, but he never believed that her problem was alcoholism. It certainly imitated alcoholism in a very superficial way, he recalled in 1983. She'd fly into these rages, never at me, ever once, always at Harry Cohn or her father or her mother or her brother. She would break all the furniture and she'd get in a car and I'd have to get in the car and try to control her. She'd drive up in the hills trying to take her own life. Terrible, terrible nights. And I just saw this lovely girl destroying herself. I admire Yasmin so much, the daughter. Yasmin Aga Khan spoke of her mother's struggle with alcohol. I remember as a child that she had a drinking problem. She had difficulty coping with the ups and downs of the business. As a child, I thought she has a drinking problem and she's an alcoholic. That was very clear. And I thought, well, there's not much I can do. I can just sort of stand by and watch. It's very difficult seeing your mother going through her emotional problems and drinking and then behaving in that manner. Her condition became quite bad. It worsened and she did have an alcoholic breakdown and landed in the hospital. Her heavy drinking and depression began after the deaths of her two brothers in March 1974. After an outburst in January 1976 at London's Heathrow Airport, Hayworth and her agent were asked to leave a TWA flight. There was a lot of bad press around that incident and a disturbing photo from it appeared in newspapers the following day. I'm not going to post it because that's sad knowing what she was going through. I'm not going to do that. Hayworth's alcoholism masked the early signs of Alzheimer's disease, which were only diagnosed years later. Yasmin Aga Khan spoke of her mother's disease saying, it was the outburst. She'd fly into a rage. I can't tell you. I thought it was alcoholism, alcoholic dementia. We all thought that. The papers picked that up, of course. You can't imagine the relief just in getting a diagnosis. We had a name at last, Alzheimer's. Of course, that didn't really come until the last seven or eight years. She wasn't diagnosed as having Alzheimer's until 1980. There were two decades of hell before that, end quote. Alzheimer's disease have been largely forgotten by the medical community since its discovery in 1906. Medical historian Baron H. Lerner wrote that when Hayward's diagnosis was made public in 1981, she became the first public face of Alzheimer's, helping to ensure that future patients did not go undiagnosed. Unbeknownst to her, Hayward helped destigmatize a condition where people were still embarrassed during those times to have it. Due to Hayward's declining health, a Los Angeles Superior Court judge ordered in July 1981 that she be placed in the custody of her daughter, New York's princess, Yasmin Aga Khan. During her final years, Hayworth was cared for by her daughter who had her live in the apartment next to hers at the San Remo on Central Park West. Yasmin's response to the question about her mother's health was, in any case, she's stunning, but it's just a facade, end quote. In 1983, Rebecca Wells arranged to see her mother for the first time in seven years. Speaking to his lifelong friend, Roger Hill, Orson Welles expressed his concern about the visit's effect on his daughter, saying, Rita barely knows me now, Wells said. He recalled seeing Hayward three years before at an event which the Reagans held for Frank Sinatra. When it was over, I came over to her table and saw that she was very beautiful, very reposed looking, and didn't know me at first. After about four minutes of speaking, I could see that she realized who I was and she began to cry quietly. End quote. In an interview which he gave the evening before his death in 1985, Wells called Hayward one of the dearest and sweetest women that ever lived. Rita Hayworth lapsed into a semi-coma in February 1987. She died at age 68, really young, from complications associated with Alzheimer's disease on May 14, 1987, in her home in Manhattan. A funeral service was held on May 18, 1987. Her headstone includes Yasmin's sentiments to yesterday's companionship and tomorrow's reunion. The Alzheimer's Association hosts an annual benefit known as the Rita Hayworth Gala in both Chicago and New York yearly. 
1985, Princess Yasmin Aga Khan established a program in memory of her mother. She is hosting the events and is a major benefactor to organizations working to combat Alzheimer's diseases. More than 72 million had been collected through galas in Chicago, New York, and Palm Beach, Florida as of August 2017. This is all I have for the video. It was a lot, it was a lot, but like I said, this was just really sad. Can you imagine all your life, no one just accepting you for who you are, you have to change? And I know a lot of people like to say, well, these stars ask for it, they ask to be famous. Many of the starlets from back then, I say this again, had no choice. Their parents pushed them into this. From the age of three, she had no choice. Her father forced her into this lifestyle. And you look at someone like Brooke Shields, she was a baby and her mother already said she's going to be a star and pushed her. She was doing commercials as a baby. And Brooke Shields probably was the wildest story. But these people get into this lifestyle as kids. They have no choice. That's all they know. So drop all the conspiracy theories for a minute and put yourself in the shoes. I know we like to say, oh, they sold their souls, blah, blah, blah. Like I know it would be the case for most of these, you know, but I always have the utmost sympathy for those that were thrust into this life life by their parents who wanted to live through them. And Rita Hayworth was one of those people. She didn't even stand a chance. It just pisses me off every time I do her story or someone like Brooke Shields just angers me. And I just have no words. I have no words. It should be illegal to put your children through that. People should just not be famous until they're at least the age of 21. That's just how I feel because they don't even know what they're setting themselves up for until they get older. Comment below your thoughts. I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. If you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. Support my brother. Until next time.